Oh, if I suddenly just mute myself and turn the camera off, it's because I've got a belch like you wouldn't believe. Welcome to Makers International, a podcast of makers from three countries, two continents, and featuring five guys separated only by the same language. Here's your host, Richard Morley. Hello, 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 hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good times, whatever time it is and wherever it is you are listening. As always, I am joined tonight with Chris Cute. We're not joined. Hello, how are you? <laughs> We're joined by an internet connection, also with Joe Whitaker. You're right, Tom, yeah. Mr. Alan Robinson. How are you, fellas? And the very questionable Jamie Page. How are you doing? We've got a few shout outs as always. Lots of people have been commenting on our social media feeds over on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, iTunes, and obviously the YouTube channel as well. So a big shout out and thank you to Jack Bench Woodworking, Shelley Cole, Size Corner, Ian Brody Smith, Ian Hay, and the Badger Workshop. And it, it really is nice to get these comments and, um, and that from people. So um, a huge, huge thank you to everyone. And we would obviously encourage everyone to be uh, hitting us up on those social platforms. So what is everyone up to at the moment? Alan, how is your internet? My internet is finally up and running. It's been a few days down, but we are good to go. I'm not really working on any projects right now. I made a frame uh, with some scroll sawed letters on it over the weekend. Quick story. My uh, sister-in-law has a greyhound dog, like a racing dog. You take to the track and you actually race this thing. Every now and then they take it to their local park and they race it around the park just for exercise. I could not believe my ears this past Friday when I heard they took it to the park and were running it around. And this dog that can run, I don't give or take 50 to 60 K literally ran full bore into a fence paralyzed his neck and died on impact whoa oh could, oh, could not wow. believe it it was a loss in the family we all loved this dog so i made them the frame and scroll saw the letters of the the dog's name nyla along the top and put a picture of the dog in the frame and went over and dropped it off for them everybody's doing fine and all that it was just, it was just so sudden and unbelievable it was incredible that's sad man that's really sad <laughs> it is thank you way to start things off on a high note <laughs> hey man <laughs> That's podcasting. I mean, people always say that pets like that, they're part of the family, aren't they? And, you know, Absolutely. if somebody passes like that so very suddenly, it's even more of a shock. So, uh, yeah, my heart goes out to um, anyone that's experienced that, not just uh, yourselves over there. But uh, as Chris said, yeah, where did we um, start on a <laughs> note? Talking of Chris, what, um, what are you up to at the moment, Chris? Um, well, I put out the video uh, because we, we talked about the material sources. So I, I went ahead and put my money where my mouth was, and I milled my own lumber, and I made a project out of it. Um, and I finally just put some stain and some finish on that piece. So, um, yeah, that's done. Um, next week, uh, actually, well, what, what is going to come out on Wednesday, Thursday? So sometime tonight, tomorrow, depending on when you're listening, I will have a video out. And I was going to ask this question because I didn't know. And I know Alan has a uh, resource in Canada that's very similar to mine. I have a Harbor Freight store here in the States. And I know that you have like a Princess Auto or a Canadian Tire. We have both very, here, yeah. But it's very similar. I mean, do you, do you guys in the UK have a, a, a – are you familiar with uh, what we're talking about as far as these kind of stores, as far as they, – they sell very discounted tools, but they're, they're fine for, like, occasional use tools. I mean, do you guys have a uh, a store in the UK that I is – I guess you'd uh, be talking about Screwfix or something like that. See, I, Jamie, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. I, I don't know if you guys have something like that. Well, the thing is – um, I think Harbour Freight, they just sell Harbour Freight tools, don't they? Them like a branded shop. Well, actually, you know what? It's really it's really funny because Harbour Freight and I think it's either Canadian Tire or Princess Auto, I'm not sure. They both carry the same line of tools. It's the exact same line of tools. They just have a different name on them. I think one is called Mastercraft and, and here in the States it's called either Central Machinery or Chicago uh, Tools. Um, but they, they sell, it's the exact same tools. It's the same company. It's just got a different name in, in different countries. I didn't know if you guys had the same thing in the UK. Well, we have a, a store called Machine Mart, and they sell a range of tools under the name Clark. And that's like um, very cheap entry-level stuff, but it seems to only be in Machine Mart. But they will also sell your Makita, DeWalt, Bosch, all the other tools as well. It's not dedicated to lower end. There's a mix of everything. 
No, no, this is mostly low rent. So I, I, and to answer your question, Richard, I, I've got a video coming out about the, the, uh, the Harbor Freight tools that I have bought that I thought were actually decent. Um, and and the, okay. the, ones, the ones that didn't suck. So that, that's what I've been up to. So you, only tools that don't suck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At least the ones that I've found anyway so far. Well, I, I will confess to having not watched your, um, your free wood videos, but they are in my watch later playlist. So um, I will be watching those and I will like them and comment. I could just give you a load of hassle probably, but I'll definitely comment about something, <laughs> something when I watch them. <laughs> I'll, for, I'll forgive you, Richard. It's fine. Forgive me in advance. Excellent. I can say whatever I like now. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jamie? What are you working on at the moment? Um, nothing as such. Uh, I've made a couple of pens, which I've posted on my Instagram. Um, apart from that, I've been kind of looking at bowl blanks and arguing with them as to what they want to be, apart from bowls, as to what shape they want to be, rather. Um, presumably not, round. Yeah, presumably round. Uh, I've been kind of decided on what I want to do with them. I'm, I'm kind of thinking of doing a, like a seaside kind of thing, like putting um, epoxy into it and kind of inlaying seashells and sand and that kind of thing into it. So I don't know. It's it's kind of playing around with it at the moment. And I've got a, a music theme one I've got uh, in mind as well with some different coloured epoxy, but I'm not going to give too much away on that one. That's why I've had in my head for a little while. Seashells and epoxy. I think you've been hanging around with Joe for far too long. It's not Millie Putt resin. <laughs> no, but he, he, he's the sort of person that would put seashells in something, let's be honest. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think you're not the far wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> Any advances on seashells, Joe? No, no seashells with me. Um, I've been doing some gifts this past week. I've got two gifts completed. So it's really something that I can't talk about and I really want to share pictures of them and show everybody what I've been doing but I've got to send them to the States so it's probably going to be perhaps a month before I can even release videos to do with them. So to tide me over I'm going to have a quick tip video and I'm going to be starting the, the arms to the rocking chair finally so that's what I'll be having coming out in the near future so to speak. Good stuff. Well I, um, I actually haven't been working on any videos because I'm just still constantly busy. However, I did video some stuff um, a little while ago of some, I think I might have even mentioned it in a previous episode, I did some door thresholds and cutting down that tree. I've been playing around and, um, and editing those, so they should be up soon. Um, but today I had, and sometimes I think I really have the best job in the world because I went to work um, this morning. I'm doing some big fitted wardrobes for a client and the, I got there and the lady said, oh, would you like a cup of tea or coffee? And yeah thanks very much about half an hour later she came in with like this proper little tray and a little teapot with a knitted tea cozy on it and some nice little biscuits and all the rest of it and she's just been really nicely looking after me all day long so thankfully i've got to go there tomorrow and finish off so that's been my week so far and then obviously i was out working all last week so i'm super yeah. super busy you doing the same work that nicola did uh, a couple weeks back because she talked about the same lady who brought her a big old pot of tea and some biscuits <laughs> you know, if, if you go and look on my twitter feed i actually the first thing i did was take a photograph of the tea and biscuits that were sent and i tagged nicola in it and said i hope this isn't <laughs> going to jinx it like it did you she replied back about two minutes later saying that she'd just cut herself on her chisel first thing on a Monday morning. So I was like, oh, I, thought was, I thought you were still a word from the poor girl. I mean, it was, it was <laughs> shame on you. What are we doing for main topic tonight? Uh, I think we've got some more questions, haven't we? We had left off the last episode where we were talking about um, the questions that people answer. We, and we didn't get a chance to get to all of them because, I mean, Richard, we had like 30 of them. And I think we en ended up answering like 10. So we're trying to attack it again and uh, pick up the same... Uh, uh, the pace that we had last time as far as the questions that were being asked because we want to answer them. That is exactly right. So um, I think probably I guess we'll go through these questions then. So um, just uh, get the first one up. Somebody's asked, uh, how important is it to have professional lighting and cameras to do what you do? It seems to me rather an expensive undertaking. I think I'll kick this one off and say 90% of my videos that I put out are filmed on my mobile phone. And I don't even have any lights in my workshop at all. Not one, not a single one, because obviously it's all glass and I use daylight. So it's not it's not important at all, I don't think. Well, I absolutely agree. You don't need anything more. The, the phones these days, 
they rival DSLR cameras like you wouldn't believe. If you're shooting like a straight normal video, like a a step by step uh, build video, that's all you need. Your your phone will set the lighting for you. It's gonna set the ISO and the aperture, everything you need, a hundred percent automatic. It really depends on how serious you want to be with it, and how far into uh, how do I say you know being a filmmaker you really want to be. I will shoot with nothing less than a DSLR with a series of lights. But that's just me personally because I'm tr I'm going out of my way to try and be cinematic. You absolutely do not need any of that. Some of my older videos, my first 80 videos or so, all shot on my LG Flex phone. And some of them look just as good or if not even better than some of the films I make today. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I, I do use a GoPro occasionally, but that really is more for trying to get like fish eye wide angle stuff that I can just exactly. put the camera on going or if I want to put the camera in a weird place just because it makes it a bit more interesting for me filming it as much as anything else. You've always got the option of using After Effects or using Adobe straight up to add a fish eye angle to it or any effect. You wouldn't believe the effects that are out, you, out there these days. You can go and buy effect packages uh actually you can just keep renewing trials a little tip for you there and uh yeah. you can literally just get any effect you want and apply it to it i mean i used a series of about probably 30 different effects that just to me are mind-blowing so do you use adobe after effects for your editing stuff or i 90 percent use just adobe's uh, adobe premiere pro cs6 but i do use after effects for uh uh there's one uh, effect called swish pan that you cannot uh, achieve with just regular Adobe. It's basically um, anybody who watches uh, Casey Neistat would notice uh, the odd film he makes when it, when he cuts scenes and I'm, I'm having a trouble explaining this, but the camera looks like it turns around in a 360 degree motion in a split second. That's called oh, yeah, pan. Yeah. For some reason, you just can't affect that or uh, achieve that with just regular uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. You have to import it into After Effects apply the effect to it and re-render it back out takes forever and most people wouldn't think it's worth it but to me it is because it looks amazing to somebody who's just getting into this that's going to sound real freaking confusing and alan i appreciate your, 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 <laughs> your, your, your love of cinema uh but joe i mean what do you think just starting out you've got to echo what richard and alan have just said really your mobile phone is all you need and the quality that you get with that it's more than adequate for youtube but I was asking these same questions when I was finding, like, I wanted to start a YouTube channel and I got the same answers, just use your phone and everything like that, but you want to hear that bit more just to improve it a little. So I would highly recommend investing in lighting because lighting not only helps your video production, but it's also handy to have good lighting in your workshop. You can see what you're doing a lot easier and it's just, it's a nicer environment to work in. Now I've got um, LED lights in my workshop and they're very similar to the fluorescent tubes and the bulbs initially are more expensive it cost me £20 per bulb and I've got four bulbs in my workshop but they're guaranteed for 20 years so I'm more than happy to foot the bill up front for those knowing that if there was to go within 20 years I can get new ones replaced free of charge and everything like that and the lighting has been a massive improvement just working when I'm not filming I feel like I can actually see what I'm doing for a change. So if you're going to look at, right, I want to spend a bit of money to make my videos look better, stick with your phone and get some decent lighting and it, you don't have to break the bank and you'll see a big difference. Joe, what do you use for lighting? This is something that really confused me when I first started buying lights. I actually bought the wrong ones first. Um, do you use warm white, white white, 5,000 lumen, 7,000 lumen? Well, here's the thing. I made the same mistake because the website was labelled wrong. I wanted to order um, Daylight White, which is what's recommended for all filmmaking. It's supposed to match the sun and everything like that. But I ended up exactly. with Warm White. Now, the Warm White ones, they've got the yellowish tint, but it still looks okay. And your eye, living in, like, getting used to your normal CFL bulbs and your old-fashioned light bulbs, we am used to a more yellow light in the house. So you, people would probably prefer working in that light, but for cameras, it's best to stick with the daylight white if you can. Absolutely. I did the same thing. I got warm white, which the end result was me basically pumping up the ISO on my camera, which anybody who knows film means you're going to get a lot of grain and it's 
ultimately going to look even more like crap. You're you're actually better off with worse lighting. I, I think I I I, I think the uh, the uh, the basis of the question was, um, do you need all that stuff? And the answer is, if somebody's trying to get started in YouTube and making videos, then you know what you need. You need some light in your workshop, and you need uh, a, if you have a phone, you can use your phone. Uh, it is just that easy. That's how I started. Now, granted, what these guys are talking about uh, are kind of the things that you find out later on down the line because you find the limitations of your camera. And I w I'm not able to zoom in on my camera, I'm not, but you can do it later on in production. And it, it's just, you know, do me a favor. Just get started and find a camera. Uh, and if the camera it happens to be on your phone, then that camera, trust me, is good enough to get going. He's absolutely right. <laughs> my yeah, probably yeah. first 30 videos, I actually edited on my phone as well wow. like all the all the cut and snip and all that and it was a nightmare because you know fat fingers on a tiny little phone trying to like put the slider to wherever and then add the next bit and all that. you know it was a bit of a nightmare but i put out at least 30 videos like that and yeah granted looking back on them they're not my greatest works perhaps but i was you know i was just finding out whether i wanted to do it and i had fun doing it and obviously i have continued doing it although perhaps not on the most regular of time slots or whatever, but it can be done. You don't need anything but a phone and maybe maybe just a way to hold it. And I even made that in the workshop as well, some little clumpy thing to hold my phone. So yeah, just get out and do it. And then if you find it fun, you end up getting interested in lighting and ISO and whatever that other stuff was as you, as you kind of go. So what's the next one da, 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 da. here in europe i can find da, ha, 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 dado blades right uh here in it here in europe i can find dado stack blade sets for sale but my saw does not accept them and i can't find any saws that do who in europe does a saw that will take a dado set many us based makers use them but i put off some projects not being able to use this method I've got a little thing to say on this, but does anyone else want to dive in? Joe, Jamie? All I know is just rumours, so I think you're in a much better position than me. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same as Joe. I've heard so many different things over the years. From my understanding, and you know, the majority of sentences that start with the word apparently are all made up, but um, there is a EU legislation which is to do with the acceleration and deceleration and the momentum and the way the blade works. And if you start stacking blades together, you increase the mass and, and all the rest of it. So the European people have said they don't want those items sold within the EU. But you can. there's nothing stopping you as a person either modifying it yourself or importing something from the US or Canada. Because um, you have them in Canada, right? Don't you, um, Alan? We do have them in Canada. So there's nothing stopping you importing them from overseas. And that's why you can buy the stacked blades. I can't imagine they're a big seller, though, to be honest. As far as being put off a project, use a router. You know, what, what's the widest your um, data stack will go, Chris? Uh, well, you know, mine, mine will go uh, past three quarters of an inch. But I think the issue is, is I don't know, guys. I mean, you tell me. I think what the uh, and, and if I'm interpreting this question incorrectly, then you let me know. Um, but the table saws that are available for you to buy, do they or do they not have an arbor? on the table saw that will accept a dado stack. No, they um, don't. Well, see, now that's, I think that's the basis of the question. Um, why aren't the saws that you guys have availability to purchase have the option for you to do that? Is that because of the regulation? Or yeah, is that but, just, so that's basically it. It's because yeah, they I mean, don't want you putting a, a dado stack on there. So if you have a saw that doesn't have an arbor on it, then you have to look for other options. And then that goes back to you, Richard, which is saying, um, well, then you know what? You've got the option of using a router. Um, Absolutely. And that's basically your only choice. Because if you are stuck in that situation and you don't have an arbor that will accept the data, then you've got limited choices. And the best choice would either be one of two things, either a radial arm saw, because most radial arm saws, and I don't know about the ones sold in the UK, but most of the radio arm saws that were back made back in the day, if you can pick up an old one, have an arbor that will accept the dado stack. Um, and if they don't, then you're back to what Richard was talking about. You're back, you're back to talking about using a router um, and a, a router sled or something of that nature that, that will allow you to make that cut. 
Trouble is, I've never seen a radial arm saw in the UK. That surprises me because I'm telling you, if you want to make shelving or bookcases of things of that nature and you want to line up two boards that are going to be exactly the same uh, width, you, the, the best tool in the world to have is a radial arm saw. And, and I don't have, I have a, a radial arm saw, but I, I don't use it that often because I don't do that kind of work that often. But uh, that surprises me to hear that you say, Joe, that you don't have that many available. I think if you go into most like builders merchants where they'll um, cut timber to length, they all use radial arm saws, but they're from you know, the 80s or older, I think. They're, they're not particularly common. But there was such a thing as a, a wobble blade, of all things, which was basically two saw blades, and then it had like some mechanical thing between them. So as you turned this dial, it would deflect the blades at sort of an angle like a v shape those are scary but the point of that is if you if they were available over here and actually they they might even predate when the uk joined the common market so they might be like back to the late 60s before this legislation came in i don't know but if there's equipment out there that will take those wobble blades then there's nothing stopping those presumably that will take a, a stacked set I, I guess the bottom line is no, they're not available in the EU, but you can import them. Um, and yeah, you can get the um, the stacked blades. So just use a router. And actually, Chris, you know, you were talking about using a radial arm saw to line up two boards to book match for a um, a shelf or something. Right. Do that with a router. One sure. the two boards together, straight edge, and they'll always be perfectly aligned when you, when you do yeah, that. Of course, of course. It's, way, it's, it's way a different tool, same way to do it. Yeah, exactly. Richard, JP, and Joe, do you guys have data stacks that you've imported and converted and done whatever you have to do? Nah. nah. No, I don't go on. No, three no's. <laughs> do we have time for a, a very quick noob question? <laughs> this will be very quick. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it. When I bought my table saw, I bought no. a new and it came <laughs> with with a couple of accessories. You talk about a dado blade, you got your regular eighth inch blade, you got your wobble blade. I have a fourth thing it came with that scares the crap out of me. I only ever used it once. It's uh, basically, it's about a quarter inch thick plate that you hook on the same way you would your, your, uh, your standard blade. But then it has four pieces of what look like router blades or pieces of molding that you tighten down onto it. These four big blades that have different profiles. Well, you've, 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 well, you've, got, you've got a shaper. No, that, thing, that, that, that darn thing will scare the hell out of you. Yeah, it, it's a shaper, I think is what you're talking about, Alan. It, and, and that can, how, how old is your table saw? About 15 years. Okay, well, and back in the day, they used to, they used to sell those accessories. Uh, and, I mean, there are now dedicated machines to be shapers, but, um, yeah, that <laughs> scared yeah, the crap out of me. It's been on the shelf yeah, ever you, since. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can do you can do moldings and all kinds of things with shapers, but it's just not a tool you you really want to be a uh, new uh, to uh, work with. You, uh, you don't want to work with a shaper if you're brand new to the freaking craft. It's just, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> just no just like you. Richard said, I switched to the router immediately. I'll never touch that thing again. <laughs> Well, I mean, a, a shaper or a spindle molder is basically the big brother of a router in a table. Um, they're usually on massive steel blocks about five inch diameter, and then you fix those cutting knives in various profiles to that head. But it sounds like you might need to. Is there a way to slow down the, the arbor speed or anything? No, not on mine. They're, they're normally get, going a lot slower than a. Um, a table yeah. saw blade, I think. Yeah, these, these were sold as table saw accessories, and they ran at the same RPM as a table saw blade would. And yeah. it's just, uh, it, well, yeah, it's just, yeah, no, I don't think I'd play with that too much myself, personally. But hey, you know, there are people out there who may. <laughs> hey, I'll post a picture of it on my uh, Instagram if anybody wants to see what it exactly it is I'm talking about. If nobody else understands. Oh, well, I definitely like. That'd be interesting to see that. So yeah, if you um, if you could. Mate, that'd be Hashtag good. Makers International. Question number three. When you guys buy tools, which is the more important to you, quality or affordability? That's an interesting one. I'll let someone else start this. I reckon Joe's a bit of a cheapskate, so he's going to go for affordability. Is that right or wrong, Joe? That's 100% right, especially starting yes. out. I think anybody who's starting out, first thing you look at is the price tag. I mean, don't get me wrong, I always look at reviews. And I like to think that I'm actually investing my money, however little it may be, into something that's going to last at least as long as I plan to use it. But all my tools I started out with was second hand. And the first new tools that I started buying was on the cheaper end of the scale. 
But once I found that I was in a position that I'd got the tools that I felt I needed and I used often, that was when I started to look and think, right, I'm going to go for a quality drill now because I'm using a drill a lot. So then I'd save my money and I'd get a better quality drill. But for anybody who's starting looking to buy a new tool that they've never used before, I know it's kind of counterintuitive as to think, well, get a cheap one now and get a more expensive one later. But nine times out of ten, you get the cheap one and you end up sticking with it and it does exactly what you want and there's no need for the expensive one ever. So you can get yourself a bargain when you're when you're looking the right places. See, uh, with, with with me, if it comes when it comes to buying um, tools, you can get say you go to like a, a boot fair or something like that. You obviously see people getting rid of old tools and things like that. I mean, I've I've seen band saws, I've seen routers and things like that. If I wanted to go and say for argument's sake, buy a router, I don't want to go and buy one that's second hand or things like that, or one that looks remotely damaged, if you like, because that's something that could, quite frankly, hurt you and hurt you serious, you know? Yeah, definitely, especially um, with routers. That, that's yeah. something that, whether it's a, a high-quality uh, router or not-so-good quality router, it's something that you want to buy brand new. So that that's kind of my theory on that kind of sort of thing, you know? It, it doesn't really... It, it all depends on, is it going to hurt you or not? But then also you've got the... If, particularly with electronic stuff, I guess you, you don't know how abused or not that's been. Yeah, exactly. You, you might get lucky and somebody's only used it a couple of times, or you might yeah. get unlucky and find they've only used it a couple of times, but they knackered the bearings or the motor or you know something like that. Yeah, but, well, least, I, I was um, I was actually given a Bosch router uh, not so long ago, and I opened up the box thinking, oh, I'm not going to use this, and it looked brand new, and I was like, oh, bonus. Yeah, if I can interject here real quick, it's the question was, do, do we want quality or do we want affordability? Um, and I think, um, and if I'm wrong, you guys correct me. I think that the most intelligent answer to that question is to say, you know what, buy the best that you can afford. And if the best that you can afford is the cheapest one that's out there, then you know what, go with it. Um, because we look a lot of cases like you guys are talking about, we're talking about occasional use tools, which kind of leads into that, that, that video I'm doing later on in, uh, tonight or tomorrow. Um, it, it's just like, if you can't afford, look, look, I mean, let's, let's all be honest. If we could all afford a Powermatic 66 brand new in our shop, we'd have one. Um, but if, if we can't afford one, then, then you go out and you buy what you can afford, but the, the, the decision needs to be made as to what's the best I can do with my money. And that's always the answer, is, is always find the best quality you can get with the money you currently have on hand to go out and buy. Um, and that's how I buy my tools. I don't buy premium tools um, because I don't have premium money. Uh, I buy the best I can buy for the money that I have on hand. And so it's it really depends if you have a plan say, see i'll give you an example i had i had a plan for a while back to go out and buy a nice really really nice cabinet saw i'm not gonna drop names here but i had a, i had a plan to buy a really nice cabinet saw and i had the money saved for this cabinet saw and i was about ready to pull the trigger on it and i stopped and i said well chris if i do this i'm investing all my eggs in one into one basket and it's just to have a really really nice cabinet saw when I realized I, what I also needed was a lathe, I needed a sanding station, I needed all these other things. And so I started looking at other options. And so I bought the best I could buy as far as the table saw. Granted, am I as happy with this table saw as I would have been if I bought? No. But you know what? If I, if I had bought that table saw that I originally tried to buy, I wouldn't have been able to afford the lathe. I wouldn't have been able to afford this, this, and this, and this. So it would have been a lengthier process. Buy the best you can afford with a plan in mind. I guess is the best advice I could give for that guy. Yeah, I guess the, the flip side of, of that is if somebody's looking to start out, they don't necessarily have a plan to move forward. They might, you know, just want to be getting into scroll saws and then they might get into scroll saws and think, oh, I mean, now I want to get into this or now I want to get into that because they make scroll saw baskets and now I want to turn bowls. So being able to do that is all well and good, you know, for the, um, I'm going to really mess up trying to explain this, I guess. Um, like you said about the occasional use 
And we do that in every day with every purchase we make, whether it's our houses, our cars, or the food we put on our plates, or the restaurant we go and eat out at. So it, that's always a, a you know, a, a balancing act that people potentially have a real headache with. What gets me is when people have a pop because what might be affordable to one person might not necessarily be affordable to them. And then people start getting into these, you know, brand wars with Powermatic against Jet or DeWalt against Silverline or Harbour Freight or something like that. Yeah, it, it, it becomes a real, I, I don't know. It, just, it, it seems like it's, it's almost a prestige factor. Like people buy these tools to show everybody how good they are because they own this freaking tool. And, it, you know, the tool doesn't make the maker. The maker makes the tool. I mean, buy what you can afford and do what you can with it. Because I can tell you, I, I, I'm not going to blow my own horn. I've made some incredible stuff out of some really freaking cheap tools. And you don't need to have the name brands. I mean, quality versus uh, affordability. Affordability. I mean, uh, buy buy the best that you can. I mean, that's the answer to the question. Buy the best that you can afford, and and call it good enough. And when you can upgrade, upgrade if you want to. If you don't want to, have to then don't. That's that's pretty much the bottom line. When I first started out doing what I do as a business, I did exactly that. I bought what I could afford when I needed to do it. And an interesting story. I had a a couple of comments a little while ago about um, you know it was the sort of I don't like these videos because you use festal stuff. Like, okay, why? Why? Why do you just hate it? Because and it kind of got into this long conversation. But I, up, over the years, I upgraded to quite a bit of festal stuff. Now, not just because it's good quality stuff, but I'm using it day in day out. Plus, I'm using it for my videos because that's all part of my business model as well. But a lot of people don't realise that if that tool goes down. It's not like, oh, I've got to go and get another one this weekend or something like that. Is that that could be missing me an opportunity to earn money tomorrow. But that tool's insured. So if somebody nicks it, I only have to pay £100 excess and it's insured. If it breaks, there's parts available and it does a good job. So the whole package altogether makes it quality and affordability because if it does get stolen from another brand, I've got to go and outlay the whole lot again, not just the excess on the insurance. So depends on people's um, settings. Do you guys care that woodchucks chuck wood? It depends how much wood them chucking. Is that like a Jacob's <laughs> chuck? Three, four, what, I'm, not, I'm a bit... Um, <laughs> yeah, could be a quick do, release chuck. I do care that woodpeckers peck wood, though. As long as the woodchuck chucks the wood my way, I'm good with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, I think we're all. I think we're all agreed on um, on that. Chuck it our way, and we'll do something with it. As long as it's not plywood, I've got enough of that. I'm offended by this question. <laughs> is it touching a nerve for your uh, sensitive disposition over there? Is it, Alan? <laughs> was that a serious question? Was that a serious question? Was that a serious question? Yeah, no, I don't care for woodchuck. Wood. I mean, as long as the woodchuck chucks the wood in my book, <laughs> job, I'm happy with it. <laughs> There are no such things as stupid questions on this podcast. <laughs> no. Obviously. Uh, how would you define yourself? Um, I'd say intelligent, good look. Oh, hang on, there's more to this. Uh, oh. Do you consider yourself professional or hobbyist? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> For me, I'd say I'm just a hobbyist, hobbyist. to be honest. Yeah. I, I, honestly, I don't do enough to be a professionalist. I do what I like, when I like, when it comes to making. If people want something, I'll make it for them. It's, it's as simple as that. Have you done commission work for money? Every now and again, someone will ask me the same, but I don't. I really don't charge them what I should do. I basically, I basically, I, I charge them enough that I can buy another little piece of wood that I can, so I can make an, the next project. It's all I do it all for fun. Okay, how about you, Alan? I'm right there with JP, 100% hobbyist. Uh, however, I did dabble a little bit a while back. Uh, I did start like a a web store, and I, you know, put specifics on it that I could make things I knew I could make well and efficiently. And I did start selling and it was doing all right. I could not stand dealing with the people online after a while, though. That was when I realized I'm definitely just a hobbyist. This is not for me full time. I already have a job woodworking that, and YouTube. That's my hobby. Was that on Etsy, was it? Or one of those? No, it was, um, sorry. It was my own uh, Facebook uh Oh, right. business, a Facebook business page that was just for here locally only. I wasn't uh, selling, uh, I wouldn't send anywhere. 
Uh, and people did reach out on a regular basis, but I, I would never do it. If I could drop it off that their house personally and meet with them, I would do it. Otherwise, that uh, wasn't for me. Okay. And Chris? Um, no, I, I have done commission work in the past, um, but I haven't uh, ever, ever, ever wanted to make this a profession. Um, it's, it, it, it just happens to be a hot, it happens to be something that it's happened to love and I don't want to turn it into a job, um, because I've done a job that I, I loved, uh, and I, it turned into a job and I don't want to ruin this for myself. So no, I'm a hobbyist. I, I, I do this as a hobby. I mean, if I can do something and make some money, am I going to turn my nose up on it? No, of course I'm going to make, I'll, I'll make money if I can, but I'm not, gonna, but I'm. I'm very flexible as far as what I will and won't do. Uh, so I have never made this uh, to put food on my table. I've never made this a uh, uh, craft that I need to uh, keep the roof over my house. It's just, it, it, it's, it's what I do for fun. And it's what I do for relaxation. And to be honest with you, I think a lot of people that follow us on uh, either YouTube or uh, wherever uh, are, are pretty much the same. I'm more, uh, uh, the majority, I think the majority of people are garage guys because, I mean, the professionals aren't going to learn much from us because they already know it. Um, and, and, and so the guys are just out there having fun and trying to figure out how to do something. And that's how I kind of approach what I do. It's just, it's, it's, just, it's just fun. It's a hobby. I'm not a professional. I don't claim to be. Never will. Okay. That's interesting you say about um, you don't want it ruining the hobby ruining your job or the job ruining your hobby, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So what about you, Joe? I think I know what you're going to say. Same as everybody else, at this moment in time, it's pure hobby, pure enjoyment, exactly what the same, what everybody else has been saying. But I have the ambition to turn it into my career. I've done about three or four, maybe five commission projects, and I'm working on my biggest commission to date, which is the rocking chair but every single one of those commissions has just been cost of the materials to make it, like no profit involved sort of thing. So when I get to the stage health-wise that I would be able to think, right, I can actually keep this up at a steady pace, that's when I'd like to look into it as far as, right, what can I make, what can I sell, can this be a viable business? Because going back to like what Chris was saying, I love this and I would hate for it to turn into a job job. But if I can make a career doing what I love, then that is my end goal. And I can see it in my mind. It's in my mind's eye. If I get there, great. If I don't, it's a hobby that I'm loving. And I'll, I'll always be woodworking and making stuff. That's the be all and end all, really. To have that dream and follow it, obviously, that, that's, a, that's a big step to go from hobby to sort of profession. But don't be dissuaded or don't be tempted to be swayed away from that by anyone if you if you enjoy what you're doing there's always potential to earn money from it if you are you know dedicated and you're good at it um, me personally i people ask me you know what do i do what am i and it, i always struggle with an answer because yeah i guess on the one hand i am a professional because i go out and i do quite a bit of client work but on the other hand I kind of, I don't feel like it's my job. It is, and it's my business. A big part of my business is doing client work. But I actually kind of now feel coming from an office job that I hated, like I've retired. I don't know if that makes sense to people, but I genuinely feel like I get paid for doing what I love doing. It doesn't feel like a job always. There's the odd occasion where you get, you know, a bad job that goes wrong or la la la, you get headaches. But generally speaking, I don't consider myself, I mean, I'm not a carpenter, I'm not a joiner, I'm not a cabinet maker or anything like that. I just love doing what I'm doing and, you know, people pay me to do my hobby. So I hope that makes sense to people asking that question. Uh, when I get a chance to go out into my shop, it's usually just me spending all day all by myself. I can feel for that. Um, do you guys ever get lonely? How do you manage spending so much time working alone? Um, don't have any friends or hate everyone you know. That's probably the easiest way to cope with spending time on your own. Um, no, no, in all seriousness, and personally, it doesn't bother me, but I'd be interested to know what you guys have got to say about that. How do you cope? Well, I've got a deep and I've got a kind of a heavy answer to this. And so I, I apologize up front if this gets too serious. Are you going to um, say you haven't got any friends? No, I've got... 
<laughs> You're probably right about that, right? Uh, but when I'm out in my shop and I'm doing what I want to do, um, uh, the craft that we're doing is my friend. Um, and my execution and my time that is spent with it is entirely focused on my friend. And my friend requires me to focus on what I'm doing. Because if I don't focus on what I'm doing, I will make really bad things really fast. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just like, I, I, I don't, I, well, my companion when I'm out in my shop, and trust me, I'm out in my shop eight hours a day, and I am all by myself, but my craft allows me to focus on the craft. It's my best friend. When I'm there, and I don't have a need to have interjection from anybody else, because I'm learning as much as, as as much as everybody here on the panel is. You know, we've already professed that we're most of us are hobbyists. Richard, I know you're a professional, uh, but I mean, I really focus in on what I'm trying to do, and presumably you have to focus, otherwise you're going to lose a finger at some point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I actually, I absolutely focus in on what I'm doing and I do not get lonely about it because my mind is constantly working uh, along with the craft that I'm trying to build. And if I, if I don't focus on my friend that I consider a friend, my craft, then I will either get hurt or I will lose interest or whatever the case may be. But I, I don't ever get lonely because I, I, I guess the, the, the short and quick answer is, is I get lost in myself when I'm doing it. And that's why it is so relaxing. That's why yeah, it is so... I've, yeah, I, to I totally agree with Chris. He's, when, I mean, when I go into the shop, I, kind of, I put my music on and I go into kind of like, the best way I can explain it is like a, a trance state. And you, you sit on a scroll saw and you sit there for two to three hours and you, you, the whole the rest of the world is kind of like tunnel vision you know the rest of the world just blackens out and you just zone in on what you're doing and everything else just disappears you know it, it's, it's brilliant I, I think that's one of the reasons why i love it it just gives you a chance to relax i, I did that exact same thing today actually jamie i um when i was making this um, fitted wardrobe and a lady came in with a cup of tea and I'd stopped for a couple of minutes to have a cup of tea. And as I was drinking, I was looking out the window and whatever it was. And then I finished for a cup of tea and I went to do the next part. And it was like five minutes in my head. And then I went outside and it was dark. And I was like, oh, crikey, I better pack up and go home. Otherwise, I'm going to not have any tea when I get in. So, yeah, time zones just really... Just, as Chris was saying, and as you said, Jamie, it, duh, 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 and you, you get focused in and you lose all sorts of track of time. Do you find that, Alan? Yeah, I, I find myself getting into a trance watching bacon sizzle, let alone uh, chiseling wood, which is far more uh, interesting than bacon. But on the flip side of this, I uh, have... I don't know. I don't know. Bacon's pretty high <laughs> up there. I don't know. I don't know, Alan. Bacon? You said the bacon on, word. And, and, Canadian and bacon. You've got... All oh, about oh, chiseling oh. bacon. <laughs> But on the flip side of this, though, guys, I have three very young children, and my shop is connected to my house, so I can, some days, eight hours will go by, and it'll go by in a snap with nobody coming outside and joining me, and the same thing happens that happens with Chris. I'm just literally in a trance this entire time, but then there's those other days, the kids are popping in and out of the shop just constantly because they're interested in what I'm doing, for one, and they want to learn it for two, even though they're far too young. But uh, they just want, and they just want to hang out with their father, and I, I can't think of a better place than in my shop, doing what I love to do with the people I love. So, as far as being lonely, I can't sympathize in the slightest. That I think is a fairly unanimous um, answer. Joe, would you uh, have anything to add to that? Well, with me not really wanting to put too much of a downer on it, I've got um, quite a lot of health issues. So with me getting away from the world, it's my escape, going into my workshop and just shutting everything out, putting my, getting my mind concentrating on that task at hand, that project that I'm working on, and forgetting about the problems with everyday life. You're living in that moment and that's what you're concentrating on. Forget about everything else. And I have that many emails and comments from people with disabilities and in similar positions to me, and they all echo the same view. That's their escape from the world. They've got so much to deal with with their everyday life and making something in a shed or in a garage or in a workshop is just it's a different life it's it's getting out getting out of the hustle bustle of everyday life and just 
making what you want to make and the escape. So, Joe, do you mind? Do you mind if I ask? And I, I and guys, I, I, I know this is really impromptu because I know I haven't discussed this with the rest of the folks. But w- would you mind talking about um, everything that you, everything that you go through and uh, in our next episode? Would you Would you mind uh, being the focus of, of who we talk about and uh, how you've done it? Because uh, you, my friend, are first of all a, a stand up guy, and 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 all of us love you. Uh, but I know that you have struggles that all of us do. A lot of us don't. And there are a lot of people out there that may be having the same struggles that could relate uh, to how you're doing things. And, and and you might be an inspiration to some folks. Would you, would you mind, guys, if we make the next episode and talk about Joe and, and ask him about what he's all about and how he's getting through what he's doing? Is, is that something you guys feel good about? If he's up for it, yeah. Joe, you're on the spot. <laughs> you have a real inspirational story, Joe. And I think that, that getting it out to people that uh, maybe uh, – are not in your exact uh, situation, but are possibly in a similar situation that they might appreciate and, and kind of go, you know what, let's go for it. Well, I'm I'm always comfortable to talk about um, what I've been through and what I'm going through and stuff like that. It's just if people would find it interesting to listen to, I suppose. Joe, people will find it interesting. <laughs> no, I, I think you're an inspiration, Joe. I think you're really definitely awesome. yeah, I, absolutely, I really do. absolutely. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but it's it's very nice of you to say thank you. Hey, you're, welcome. you're more than welcome, my friend, because you are. And yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry to put you in that spot, my friend, but I I, I look forward to next week because I would love to talk to you about it, where you've been and what you're going through. And and, uh, uh, and all right, and I'm done. Hopefully, by the end of our next episode, Joe will realize he is an inspiration, and I think this is a good idea to do for each and every one of us down the line. Definitely. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. I'll quite happily spend an hour telling you all about Joe. That's not a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this kind of, actually, I don't think Chris really realizes what he's done here, but um, the next question is who are your favorite YouTube personalities? And after, you know, Chris's description of Joe, I think um, that leads in very nicely. So who else have you got uh, as a celebrity or personality that, uh, that you like, Chris? You know, I don't have a single person. <laughs> I, okay. got, I, How about you, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, you will. You will go. If I have to pick a top, I don't even want to tell you. It's not a maker. If I have to pick a top maker channel, uh, John Heiss has always been my favorite. I mean, there, there's three names that popped up the first time I ever typed woodworking into a search engine. And that was John Heiss, Steve Ramsey, and John DiResta. And I watched all three of them. Absolutely loved two out of three, and I know people are going to kick me for this, but I didn't like the rest of right off the bat, only because I didn't understand him. Now I do, so so don't hate me for it. But John Heiss is the one that's always really, probably because he's a fellow Canadian. He, he, I just understand him more, which is pretty typical. But he, just the way he works, the way he films, everything about it, I've always just found overly interesting. There's nothing I ever miss on any one of his channels. I never have missed. I've literally watched his entire catalog. Yeah, that, I, I quite enjoy um, watching John's stuff as well. He's um, he's got a very a really diff- raw way about him. Yeah, I was I was gonna say sort of a, a different yeah. sense of humor with with he, some of the stuff that he he's uh, very he comes raw. Yeah, he's very raw in a Canadian kind of way. <laughs> I'm, I'm half expecting Joe to say Casey Neistat, but um, I was gonna say McJugger Nuggets, and everybody laughs at me for that because apparently he caters to twelve year old boys, but. I, that man is a genius. I don't care do, what. Do you want to clarify that somewhat? Mick Jugger Nuggets is a guy who started a channel. He started like ten years ago, but about four years ago, he started what was called the Psycho Series. He played it off for three and a half years as if it was real, like a daily vlog, where he he wrote a series arc that lasted three and a half years in the most genius manner ever. And he's only twenty three years old. And he, he came out at the end of it and said, this was all fake. I wrote the entire thing. I put tens of thousands of dollars into it. And he's just a spectacular filmmaker. I don't care what anybody else says. Watch Mick Jugger Nuggets. Type the Psycho series into any search engine and just watch a few of his older episodes. They're just amazing. Come on then, Chris. This, um, who, who's your uh, sort of favorite personality? I, I, I don't have one. And I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I honestly swear to God, hand on a stack of bottles, do not have one. I get as much enjoyment out of the people that you might not expect as the people that I do expect. Uh, it's just, I, I I just, guys, I don't have a favorite. I, I'm sorry. I, I really don't. I, so I can't respond to that. I, I, I enjoy every one of you guys. 
I enjoy everybody I watch, and I I, I don't enjoy one more than the other. I, I really don't. A very honest <laughs> answer there, Jamie. I've got to be honest. I'm the same with Chris. Well, I've got a favourite. Yay! And you were you was right. It's got to be Casey Neistat. <laughs> <laughs> it it's it's really. I mean, I'm constantly talking about Casey Neistat. I'm like fanboying over Casey Neistat, but his cinematography, his ideology, his lifestyle. Even some of the things that he makes as well, because he's kind of a maker. He does some modifications and stuff like that. He's just somebody I aspire to be. Like, there's no way I could keep up to his his um, energy levels. But he's like, get up first thing, like, jogs, runs ten miles before he does anything, goes to work, films his daily vlog, edits it all through the life, family man, every, just just everything runs his own business, and he's like. It shows that you can do it. It's that get up and go attitude, similar to Chris's channel name. Make the first cut. He's like, just, just do it. Just go for it. Just get it done. So that's why I like him so much. I'm right there with you, Joe. I watch that every day too. I'm gonna skip answering this, and you'll see why in a second. But in terms of um, watching every day, presumably, Joe, you watch Casey's every day. Yep, every day. Yep. What are we watching at the moment? Well, I've um, been watching Make It Extreme recently. And they literally just put out Electric Drift Skate Cart, which is their latest video, and it's amazing. If you've seen any of those videos on their channel, the channel name is the perfect fit. Everything they make is extreme. And this this board that they made, oh, it's brilliant. The, like, the show at the end, them drifting around on it and sitting on it like it's a gold cart and everything. It's all done from scratch, welded together and everything, so... Make it extreme. If you haven't seen them on YouTube, check the links in the the show notes below and go and check them out. Get subscribed. Brilliant stuff there. Yeah, I've seen uh, I've seen a few of their uh, projects. I remember doing a, a massive uh, was it a gun in that dispenses beer cans or something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, that was one of the first ones I saw. Do you yeah. guys know how long Make It Extreme has been around? Yeah, not long at all. Yeah, uh, well, he st- they started when I started. <laughs> So about a year, uh, I was talking to him back when he had about 300 subscribers. Him and I used to talk back and forth on all our videos, and then his channel just went insane. And he'll still talk to talk. He'll still talk to you, but it's so much harder to get a hold of him now because there's like 30,000 comments a video in an instant, and it's because it's amazing. It is. That's the thing. Some people think that when people are small, they're more approachable, and they're just like kind of normal people in inverted commas. And that once they get really big, then they're better than everyone else and they stop replying oh, no. to all the comments. It, it's just because you don't have time. You know? Dude, I, I have 6,500 subscribers and I have a hard time keeping up with it. Can you imagine what it would be like with 200,000 plus? It's impossible. Yeah, it's, just it's not even possible. Bonkers. Um, absolutely crazy. Talking of crazy, Jamie, what are you watching at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm watching um, Jerry Blakesley. He's uh, bought out a channel uh, or video today on his YouTube channel called uh, Jerry's Machines. Um, He's got a group on Facebook as well called uh, Tracks of Inspiration. Um, Tracks of Inspiration was basically set up to um, inspire and motivate people uh, of all ages, uh, basically into building things with their hands. And what Jerry is doing uh, is building what will be one of many vehicles uh, to travel around to show and inspire people. He's building these vehicles to travel yeah. around in to meet people. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily to meet people. It's basically to show people that you can and it's OK. to Because what I think what he was saying was um, people are forcing college into kids and some kids right, don't yeah. want to go to college. And he wants to show kids that it's OK that you can make things with your hands and things like that. Uh, and what he's, what, he's, what he's done is you can, he's put a ramp on it. So it's, it, it basically runs on tracks this one but although it's although the title is tracks of inspiration because this vehicle is made of tracks the next one might be a hovercraft but the meaning is on the right tracks of life if you like gotcha that makes sense you know so you can you can keep up with all the updates on on the group tracks of inspiration and on youtube of jerry's machines sweet so we'll have those links in the in the show notes and uh, chris are you uh, are you watching anything interesting um actually i found a channel um, and it's not a person; it's, it's actually a business. Um, and it's uh, it's not it's an Australian company uh, that put out some YouTube videos um, that, and they've continued to be updated. I, I th- Arbor Tech. If you guys have not uh, found uh, the channel Arbor Tech, 
then you might want to check it out. Uh, they're the angle um, grinder cutting things, aren't they? Uh, well, but they, they, they're, they're, they're uh, an Australian company. They specialize in like woodworking and masonry tools. And they caught my interest because they, they, they made a serving platter out of a, uh, a split log. Um, and, I, you know, because I mean, I know my own lumber. So I was, I was curious. And I saw it pop up, you know, and, and I went, well, what's that all about? And they actually have some cool tutorials. So there are different people that host each different episode that they do because there are people that specialize in different things. But, it, you know, it's it's not a person. It's a company. And so, you know, understand that when you go in and do it. But Arbor Tech, they actually have some pretty cool videos. Uh, and not necessarily looking to, you know, give a business a plug. But, I mean, they, I thought that they did a pretty cool thing with it. So I, I figured I'd throw it out there. Arbor Tech from Australia. Australian main, main company. Hey, we're making this international, right? Let's talk about absolutely. Ourselves. People forget about businesses on YouTube, actually. And w one thing you've got to remember is, yes, they're a business. So, like you said, go into it with that. But also, they're a business. So, what they're putting out has to be absolutely factually right. Otherwise, they can get done for it. Whereas you and I can basically say what we like and go, oh, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. So, at least with the companies that you watch, you're actually getting genuine yeah. information. Alan, what are you watching? Well, anybody who follows me knows that I've been without internet for days now, and they fixed it today while I was at work. It was like a dank old junkie going through withdrawals. I've not been able to watch videos. The first one I clicked on was our man Bill Lutz from uh, Reclaimed Audio. He made uh, the Scott Turner Table of Light. Anybody catch that? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Bill, with all of his silliness and craziness, I realized is actually a freaking genius. Like, I've always looked at the man like a comedian, but he is a freaking genius. So uh, oh, anybody no. not watching Bill Lutz, and if you're not, you're crazy, go down below and click on his name because he is amazing. Oh. Yeah, Bill's a talent. Bill, Bill seriously is a talent. And, and I want to give a shout-out real quick if I can. Bill Lutz gave us a big yes. uh, shout-out on the Reclaimed Audio podcast. Bill, I want to say thank you. I also want to say that Phil and Tim, you were noticeably very quiet when you did that. <laughs> <laughs> but Phil, okay. I thought we were boys. <laughs> but that, no, that, that, no, no, I understand because they talked about a podcast after us, and they both, and both Phil and Tim chimed in. Go, oh, I love those guys, but they were noticeably <laughs> quiet. Uh, and, but, that, but that's okay. We still love you guys. Uh, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 so hoping no, I'm kidding. Uh, but <laughs> that 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 was awesome. So thank you, Bill, for the for the shout out on Reclaimed Audio. I appreciate it. I've got a couple of uh, shout outs very quickly, and one of them goes back to the question of a one of my favourite personalities, and that's Colin Furs, which you may or may not have heard about. He's from yeah. Lincolnshire in the UK, and the guy is just absolutely mental, bonkers, insane. He does just the craziest build stuff and go and watch his video and you'll understand the insaneness on his channel he built an underground bunker um, amongst other things um, and the other guy i've been watching lately is rob's workshop he um, he has some pretty cool um, projects he's got some really awesome clever storage ideas for his shop and he's actually doing a 1000 subscriber giveaway at the moment so go and check his channel out subscribe and um, dive in for his giveaway as well show the guy a bit of love i always ask here at this point where can everyone find all of us but actually where can everyone find the podcast because we've got podcast stuff online as well haven't we you can find us on twitter at makers international uh you can find us on soundcloud just type in makers international you can find us on itunes Again, type in Makers International. If you're confused at all, please go to Google and type in Makers International. Makers International. You will find us across the board. We also have a Facebook fan page, Makers International. We are not hard to find, and we are fantastic. So, <laughs> so <laughs> <now I'm> <laughs> put it humbly. Yeah, <laughs> we are hands down the best podcast on the internet. Oh, shut up! No, we are not. No, <laughs> just face it. Come on, Boston. Cool. So that's where you can find all of us as a conglomerate for the podcast what about where we can be found individually alan you can find me across youtube and facebook under the woodworking junkie and he's fantastic absolutely fantastic <laughs> he's, he is by far the best woodworking junkie <laughs> on the internet i am the finest Fuck junkie canadian. you will ever find Fuck canadian that's supposed to mean what about you chris where can we find you <laughs> oh god i don't know if you want to find me after this uh chris <laughs> on youtube make the first cut on facebook there you go
Jamie, yourself? You can find me on YouTube at JP Woodwork, and you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at JP underscore Woodwork. Excellent. And Joe, where will you be hiding? YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Average Joe's Joinery, easy enough to find. Excellent. Well, you can find me across social media, um, basically all the platforms, but if you go to brainfizz.uk, um, links to all my social media, YouTube channel, stuff, things, and other bits and pieces as well. So, I've been Rick Morley, they've been everyone else. Have a good week. You guys have a great week. See you next week. See ya. Have a week. Have a week.